Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for October the 2nd, 2020. This is episode number 26. Today, we'll be talking about the Volvo XC40 recharge beginning production, uh, the electrics at the Beijing Motor Show, and the Polestar Precept production gets the green light. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, longtime and multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. And we also have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. And he also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. Uh, if you'll notice, if you're a regular watcher, you'll notice that Martin is not with us this week. He's on vacation. So we, we hope he's having a good time. Uh, welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Um, so, yeah, what do we have? Um, charging up in our driveways this week. Kyle, I hear you have some uh, pretty exciting vehicles. Right, it's been a really good week here this week. Uh, let's see, it started off with the Audi e-tron. I think I talked a little bit about it last show, but I was able to take it on a road trip um, since then. I went to, to Louisville, Kentucky, and then down to South Carolina. And uh, overall, I had about 2,500 miles in the e-tron. And it was really cool. I wanted to test a few things with this. I wanted to see are the public charging networks good enough to go places and not just on major thoroughfares. This was not a, let me just take the one highway corridor from here to Louisville. That doesn't exist. It's you go on this little road, you go this way, it's zigzagging. And um, that was test number one. Test number two was, does the e-tron have enough range for a road trip? What's the charging curve like and all this? So, so the first thing is every charger I arrived to worked which was amazing. And I used a mix of Electrify America, which was my preferred charging, of course, because 150 kilowatt, uh, they have the only stations really that are easily accessible in this route with the high power stations. I also used ChargePoint, uh, I believe three times, and EVgo. So I used uh, three of the major charging providers here on the East Coast, especially. Uh, all worked just fine. Of course, needed my own app to activate the charger. It's not, you know, plug in charge yet we're still not there it's not as easy as plugging into tesla um, but but the networks were great i will say it was quite difficult uh even for me at times to figure out where i should charge next to optimize the trip uh it's a balance of okay how long do i charge at this station for what rates so when my next station's a 50 kilowatt uh you know i make sure to to pull in so i can take advantage of higher charging speeds and um yeah, it was just a lot of complicated stuff. Now the Audi has a built-in trip planner, but it wasn't that great. Like it's uh, uh, it's like it's, okay, it's, you're gonna stop at this AC charger for four hours. I'm like, I'm not gonna it, do it, that. It sees the chargers though, right? It, it shows you the most chargers? of them, but not all. Okay, okay. And uh, it even missed some Electrify America ones, which I was very confused about. Hmm. So I don't know. Right. I didn't <laughs> love how complicated it was to go plug share. Let me see the distance to this charger that's next. Again, I didn't do any planning. I just got in the car and I only looked at the next charger when I was sitting at the current one. Uh, so I really did this as a blind test purposefully. It's also how I mostly road trip a Tesla. The second, of course, that thing I mentioned that I wanted to talk about was the overall range of the e-tron. Right. And the range of the e-tron in our 70 mile per hour range test was 188 miles, I believe. Uh, which doesn't sound that great on paper. Uh, however, when I, uh, I'll use my Model 3 as an example because I think Tesla is really the gold standard for road tripping right now. When I go to supercharge that car, I try to pull out of superchargers with 50 or 60% and then I stretch it about 120 miles at most to the next supercharger. And that's the fastest way to travel. And the reason is the Tesla tapers pretty hard above 40% off of your 150 kilowatt charging or 250 kilowatt charging at a version three. The e-tron is able to hold 150 kilowatt charging all the way to 78%. And wow. even at 100%, it's doing 57 kilowatts. So it's like you charge really up good. to 93, 95% each station. So my road trip range is actually greater than my Model 3 because it charges so fast for so long. And uh, that was a huge thing. I was like, wow, overall range does matter. Uh, certainly if you're going to be taking a day trip out to your in-laws or whatever and coming back or something like this. 
Uh, but if you're just going on a you know charger hopping trip like I do, it really matters is what is your range after your charging session, after the car starts to taper. And it really proved that the e-tron is the king of that right now, um, which I was super impressed with. So e-tron trip was great. Awesome. Next thing we'll blow through really quick. I had the Porsche Taycan 4S. <laughs> really awesome car. What's, the, what's the sticker on that? Actually, it wasn't bad. This one was specced tastefully. It wasn't crazy optioned, and it was 129, which really isn't bad for the quality of car and driving dynamics. And okay. considering the rest of Porsche's lineup, I, very reasonably priced, I'd say. The 4S, I still believe, is the is the Taycan to buy, not the uh, Taycan to uh, to go have fun with. That's the Turbo S. So it's got more range than than the Turbo S, right? Yeah, but it's marginal, a couple miles. Oh, okay. I mean, it's really, uh, I think the Turbo S is rated at 198 or 199 uh, EPA, yeah. and the 4S is 203. So, I mean, it's the same battery pack. It's pretty much the, the same car. Right. Different inverter and motors. Uh, but the 4S, we did a 70 mile per hour range test, which will be coming out on our YouTube channel on Inside EV soon. Yes. And it was. I, the longest range test I've ever done. I thought it was the longest range test we've ever done, but that's not true. Tom had done a Model 3 long-range dual motor that went, I believe, about 10 miles farther than this car. Uh, but this that's it, 10 miles from a long range on aero wheels to this 4S on 21s. This one had the big, inefficient wheels, 305 section rear tires. It was not set up for range, and it did 277 miles. Right, two seventy seven point right? nine. Yeah. This is what we've been saying about the Taycan for so long. You know, and I've I've had the opportunity to drive it uh, a couple of occasions. Once in Europe, once in the U.S. I drove it from Atlanta down to Daytona, Florida, and uh, I wasn't doing a range test because I was with the Porsche folks, and I you know I wanted to have a little fun with the car too. Um, but I estimated when I drove it then that that car. And that was a turbo, not the Turbo S. I drove the Turbo S in 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 uh, Europe, but I estimated that at 70 miles an hour, I could have I I said that I figured I could go about 260, 265, which now you've just proven that you know um, right. maybe even further. You know, I mean the 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 turbo does have. Uh, I think I don't know what wheels you had, but I'm assuming uh, the t wheels and tire setup I had might have been a little bit less aerodynamic. But other than that. Um, you know, it should have been spot on. And that's fantastic to see, Kyle. Great job with that. Right. It was really cool. And this one had, the, I think, the worst setup for the wheel and tire combo because oh. it had the, uh, it was a $5,000 performance option, more or less. It did have all seasons, not the sticky, sticky mm -hmm. tires, but the 21 inch wheels versus mm -hmm. the little arrows. So we've been uh, working with Porsche. Hopefully we're able to get a 4S from them on the little arrow wheels because I believe that car would do more than 300 miles. Um, in pretty good conditions with the right wheels, and okay. it'll be interesting to see that. So that was and that's, yeah, that was that was great. So and this you were driving in range mode, I guess it has a range mode, right. right? So it there is a range mode. It lowers the car all the way down. It prioritizes right. front motor, so it's front wheel drive only, right. um, which is pretty interesting. So the which two speed how I guess transmission isn't really meant for range. It's meant for high acceleration at high speed. Mm -hmm. right. And so it just kind of turns all that off back there and you run in front wheel drive uh, the whole range test it took like over four hours to do the test. I did not expect it to take that long because uh, the plan yesterday was to go do a range test, run it down to zero, then charge it from zero to a hundred percent. Like we do with every EV uh, it, you know, we got 270 kilowatts into the car, which was amazing. And it held there for 10 minutes. It went from dead to 46% in 10 minutes. It went to 80% in exactly 22 minutes, which is what the Porsche website mm -hmm. states. Porsche is very accurate. And um, it actually was just a little bit faster than what the Porsche website says, of course. So, and so it's ahead. like 120, 130 miles of range in 10 minutes. Just about, yes. It's amazing how fast that car charges. It's the fastest charging session I've ever had um, because the Model 3 only does 250 kilowatts, so this was 270. So it was good oh, to nice. level up. Well, the battery temperature must have been just right because the, it's ver the Porsche's charging setup is very specific to temperature. If you're yes. just a couple degrees off, 
you'll you'll still get a high charge rate, but you might have gotten 255 instead of 270. I know when we pulled when we did the uh, the media drive, when we pulled into the uh, charging station, we were down to zero too. We were the only. Um, I was driving with uh, Alex on autos, um, and he and I were the the, the 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 media team for that car, and um, we were the only ones that drove it down to zero and rolled into the charging station. And um, when we put, as soon as we plugged in, it wasn't doing 270, and uh, we brought the Porsche engineer over, and he's like, "What's the temperature?" And he looked up the temperature. He's like, "You're two degrees Celsius too low. It's going to take a minute before it gets up to full." And he was right. As as soon as the temperature got up, whoop, it went up. So it's it's the Taycan. I mean, all EVs are, but I think the Taycan specifically is very very dependent on optimum battery temperature to hit that peak rate of 270. The other thing I wanted to talk about was something that Kyle mentioned earlier about the e-tron with the charging curve. And that's something that we talk about here on Inside EVs, Kyle and I in particular, but we, it, can, it can't be understated how important the charging curve is. People always look at the EVs and to say, well, it, it's, you know, it's peak charging is only 125 kilowatts and, you know, the next EV does 150. The 125 kilowatt charging car might charge faster then that next EV that can charge at 150 kilowatts. It depends on how quickly it gets up to the maximum charge rate and how long it holds it. Some EVs taper off very early and, you know, they hold their maximum charge rate for a, a couple of minutes. And then all of a sudden it's starting to ramp down. One of the things that Audi did so well was have that strong charging curve. Like it gets up to 150 kilowatts and it holds it as as Kyle said up to almost 80% the maximum charge rate then when you get over 80% 90% it's still charging at 50 60 kilowatts very few if not no EVs hold such a high charge rate for so long and that's part of the reason why Audi has such a big battery buffer because it, it can take that full charge rate all the way up to 100% not the full charge rate but a very high charge rate up to 100% because there's still 15 kilowatt hours left in the battery pack um, or somewhere around there. I know Audi just released, a, opened up a little bit more of the, of the battery pack as a usable capacity. Whereas many other electric vehicles use either all the pack or very close to the pack. Those cars cannot take a high charge rate after 90% because the, the, the battery just simply, you, you'll have unbalanced cells. It'll, it, it'll create all kinds of problems. So um, that's one of the things we got to give Audi kudos for. I know they, they took a lot of heat with the range that, oh, it's, it's an inefficient car. And, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of uh, talk about that early on. But Audi came out strong with their charging. And they, they, they I don't think they got as much credit as they should have for that. The uh, e-tron e is a fantastic car charging wise. I mean, it's an all around great EV. I'm sure Kyle um, enjoyed his time with it. But um, the char it has really... The, the, the one thing, if you want to say, what does the Audi e-tron do best? It's charge. Right. I hear it's a totally agree. A, the only downside to that charging curve. Oh, sorry, Dominic. I didn't hear you. Okay. Talking. I was Go just going to say, mention that you, you mentioned to me that it's like really nice massaging seats possibly. And yes, I had the prestige thick, one. It was thick glass. Nice. So it's like super quiet too. Right, so double pane glass and massaging seats, great backlighting, really good driver assistance. It was a fantastic road tripper. One of the best sound systems in the cars. Not the best, but I'd say a good eight out of 10, which is a high praise from me. Bang & Olufsen did a nice job on that system. Um, yeah, the, the car was a great cruiser, but uh, to Tom's point, charging curves really make a big difference here. Um, and, but the downside to having that great charging curve, especially if it's doing 50 plus kilowatts at 100%, and we'll be sharing the full curve on Inside EV soon in a new series, but um, it means that there is still a buffer that is inaccessible at the top of the battery that you're not able to get into. Now, the Germans look at this probably and say, well, you won't have as much degradation, charge the car to 100%, you don't have to worry about it. I look at it as, well... Can I just use the full battery, kill it, and then trade it in in three years? So, you know, everyone has their own opinions on this. Uh, I, I'd say that charging curve certainly makes up for a lot, though. It was pretty great. Yeah, so, so I'm curious. So the, uh, the e-tron, you said it charges up, to, you know, it keeps a high rate of charge, very high on the percentage. Does the Tycon mirror that? Because they're both from, uh, they're both VW products, essentially, right? 
Right. So the Tycon uh, has a little bit of a different curve because it's doing 270 kilowatts or so. Uh, this Tycon will rip 270 until about 50 ish percent. Okay. And then it will go to, um, it'll, it'll jump down pretty hard. And at 75%, I believe it's below 150 kilowatt. And then it just falls on its face. Anything okay. above 90, it's doing 14, 15 kilowatts. Uh, and that's because there isn't as much of a big buffer on the Tycon. You can see here, if you're our YouTube audience, this is how we film our charging curves during the daytime through an Amazon box uh, taped over the, the Electrify America screen. We also nice. record in the car as well, so we can compare delivered power to what's actually going into the battery and measuring that, that loss between the two. And um, yeah, it was an awesome charging test for Tycon. Uh, 10 minutes yielded 45% or so, 46%. And it just sat at 270 kilowatts. We got the battery temperature exactly right. Like Tom was saying, this was definitely on our minds. We were monitoring the battery temp all the way through the range test. We knew it was gonna be good. And it gave us a perfect zero, like the car wouldn't even move. It died, literally died in the street pulling into the charger. I had to return it back on to get a burst of power to get to the charger all the way to 100%. It took just about an hour uh, to go all the way up, but again, 80% was only 22 minutes. <laughs> so the full charge from empty, empty to 100% took an hour? Yeah, I think it was like 63 minutes, but okay. to 80% was only 22. Wow, so that's the big deal. So you you how hard it takes. 20 minutes, that's, that's really what, what you're looking at, and probably less than that, because you're not gonna start at 0%, you're gonna start at like, 10% or something. Yeah. If right. You're Unless you're trip. me or Tom, you, you start at close to zero, but yeah, most right. normal people won't do that. Right. Yeah. If, if you're on a road trip, you're not staying much longer than 25 minutes at, a, at, a, at an Electrify America station in a Tycon. And unless you really need to squeeze out those last 20, 30 miles, you're just unplugging at like 80, 85% and going. So, I mean, right. it's, you know, you, you pull up, you plug in, you go inside, use the restroom, grab something to eat, come out and uh, that's it. You unplug and you leave. I mean, that's, that's what, that's where we're at now, not just with the Tycom, with other EVs, um, with the state of charging. And, and now that we have these super high speed charging stations, you know, gone are the days where you were out there just leaning against your car for an hour and a half. Um, it's, it's plug in, walk inside, grab a cup of coffee, come out and unplug. And um, that's, that, that, that's, what's going to make, the mainstream, you know, the mainstream car buyers interested in EVs because, you know, the where we were with charging in the last decade, it, it, we just could never get mass adoption. Uh, we're still not there yet with with the infrastructure, but now at least we know the cars and the stations are capable of doing this. Now we just need to fill in the holes. Right on. All right. Right. So, so uh, before we go through, I'm sorry, there was one last point sure. about Tycon I wanted to make. Um, we sort of ran out of time because the car just didn't die. It did again, 270 something miles, it took four hours and then another hour for the charging test. We were running out of daylight, but I had the opportunity to drive it around the track last night. It was my first time really thrashing a Taycan 4S. I've driven turbo and turbo S of course, pretty hard. And the 4S was interesting because it wasn't as good on track, uh, which I guess is to be expected. But I had it there at the nighttime. As you can see, if you're our YouTube audience, it was pitch blackout. And so uh, it was really fun. He also brought around a BMW M4. We did a little chasing around the track. But the uh, biggest takeaway here was the 4S has these staggered tires, which the other ones do too, but narrower front tires and right. big junky rears. And so when you really throw it into a corner, it likes to understeer. They right. all do this. Uh, but with the Turbo and Turbo S, when you give it some throttle, it pushes the back end out. This, because it doesn't have all of that torque on the rear axle, tends to still push when you get on it. So the only way to drift a Tycon 4S is to really chuck it in with a little Scandinavian flick, uh, which we did plenty of last night. You really just got to throw the weight in. Once it's sideways, it's full on rally car and will skid around. And that's probably important to Porsche owners. Back to the I, normal news. <laughs> I, I, I saw a little clip of that actually last night. You don't have a, one of those lined up there, do you? Uh, yeah, I could probably pull one up. Actually, it's at, on uh, our. I, I believe Instagram. it was on your Facebook story. I'm not sure if it was on it made right. it to the Auto Spec Motoring uh, Twitter feed or not. Right, I but think it was, it was on my personal Facebook story. Let me uh, see if I can get this loaded was, up. 
It was a pretty uh, impressive send, I thought. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, yeah. the thing is, in, right, I have it pulled up here, actually. So let me share my screen over to this one second. And See, Martin do does that. all this behind the scenes technical. Right, I'm still figuring work. it out. Okay, here we go. So you can see full sideways. Right, on the skid pad. Right around the circle. And slingshot back down the track. Wow. Yes. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, you have okay. too much fun down there. Yeah, man. It's way too I, much. I live way too far away. Um, all right. <laughs> so let's start with some news. Okay. Uh, we were going to go right to Sweden, but actually something out of Fremont this morning, or out of California, uh, Tesla's Q3 numbers are in uh, for 2020, their production deliveries. They, for the uh, third quarter of 2020, they produced 145,036 uh, cars and they delivered 139,300. So I believe that's right up, right up in there what uh, people were estimating. I think some of the estimates went, might have went up as far as 100 and, uh, 140,000 or something. So it, we'll see what, the, what Wall Street thinks of that. You know, it's fine. They're making a lot of cars. I think that could be a record output too as well. Tom, do you have anything to say about that? Well, to be honest with you, this came in so soon. I was already dialed into the podcast. I haven't read it yet. But uh, from what I understand, that's what it's pretty much in line with what people were expecting. Okay. Uh, there were some analysts expecting a little bit more, but, you know, it just shows, you know, consistent growth. Tesla keeps putting up the numbers. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's amazing what this company is doing. Um, everyone's impressed. There's a reason why the stock is is through the roof you know they're they're doing it they're doing something that really hasn't been done in a long time and uh you know you got to give them credit for that yeah it seems like they're they're basically selling all the cars they can make the batteries for and i believe china actually have a china had a little bit of a price cut or something going on there maybe it was an incentive but uh their least expensive vehicles are are selling quite well we had a piece on inside evs earlier this week about that so the stock hasn't, uh, I don't think we've opened yet, or we may have just opened, but it looks like it's actually down after the news in uh, pre-market trading. Yeah, it uh, was up quite a bit yesterday. Interesting. It, it, okay, it popped pretty sense. hard yesterday, the last couple of days, so it could be people taking profit or, you know, it's such a dynamic stock. It's It was yeah. down like really hard last week or earlier this week at some point, and now it's, you know, back up to pre-battery, yeah, battery day kind of took the wind out of its sails a bit. Uh, but now right. it's back it's, up. It, Right, it'll take people time to digest what battery day means. Yeah. Like I said, on battery day, we didn't see a cyber truck come in with flames and a roadster flying. People aren't going to understand it or like it. You got to relate to the normal people and they did not do a good job of that during battery day. Yeah. Sure. I'm still the, I'm, Go ahead. No, I was going to say but the analysts, the people that know the industry, people like Sandy Monroe came out of it saying like this is unbelievable, this is fantastic. So, while I, I we get it that a good portion of the public kind of felt underwhelmed by battery day. Uh, the truth of the matter is what, what we saw there was really, really great news for the company. And it's, it's only going to move Tesla forward. So, uh, you know, I think as Kyle said, you know, the initial might've been a little confusion. Like what did we just see there? Was this anything, uh, the market's going to, to respond to that over time. Yeah. I'm st I'm still digesting some of the battery day news. I'm, I'm clicking on videos, explainers and just like, Man, there's just so much buried in there. I just, yeah. But anyway, let's get on to the rest of the news. Uh, let's start with some news from Sweden, or, or should I say Belgium. That's because the Volvo XC40 Recharge P8 AWD, I will drive, to use its full name, has officially begun production in Ghent, Belgium. Uh, it's the first all-electric Volvo, and it is built on the same compact modular architecture, uh, CMA, as the Polestar 2. Uh, it will also be built at a plant in China. It's a compact crossover that boasts about 240 249 miles of WLTP range uh, from a 78 kilowatt hour battery pack with about 75 kilowatt hour usable. It's got plenty of pep. It goes from 0 to 60 in 4.7 seconds. It's said to fast charge 0 to 80% in 40 minutes, uh, maxing out at 150 kilowatts. And it also has a, an 11 kilowatt onboard AC charger, pretty quick charging at home as well. And to top it off, it can tow 
3,307 pounds or 1,500 kilograms. Uh, it should be in the $50,000 neighborhood. We haven't, we don't have a price on this yet, but uh, deliveries are supposed to start this year. And originally, yeah, originally it was supposed to be on sale this year in the U.S., but the U.S. Volvo site still has it listed as a future model. So we'll see what's up with that. Uh, the original plan we had called it, for, uh, had called for it to be sold in California first, and then rolling out to the rest of the country shortly thereafter. Um, I got to see this at its launch in Los Angeles last year, and, and I think it's pretty sweet. I know Kyle has things he wants to say about this car, but uh, first, let's like hear from Tom. Tom, do you, do, could this find a place in your heart, or if not, your garage? Absolutely. I yeah. really like this vehicle. And I've got even better news for you. The dealers really like it. Now, you know, one of the things I do here in New Jersey is I work with Plug in America on our Plug Star dealer certification program. We basically help dealers better understand and better sell electric cars. So I travel around, I visit dealers every day. I work with their sales staff, answer questions, get them certified as Plug Star dealers. And one of the things I've noticed is in the past years, Dealers generally weren't excited about upcoming electric cars. They looked at them as they were more just going to be a problem. Like it's, this is something else I have to learn. This is, you know, people are coming in and asking me these questions that we can't answer about batteries and, and, and so forth and so on. But the one thing that I've noticed, two manufacturers, Ford with the Mustang, Mach-E, and now Volvo dealers are, when I show up, are, are, to asking me, okay, so what's what's the latest news on, on this vehicle? We can't wait to get it. So that's really big news. As far as I'm concerned, it might not make everybody ex extremely happy, but I work with this every day. And I'm so used to having dealers be like, all right, what, what, what plug-in car are they going to send us next? Because we know dealers have issues with electric cars in many instances, but the Volvo dealers now are so into this vehicle. They really are here in New Jersey. They're disappointed. They were supposed to get it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, we were originally supposed to have it, um, I think in September ish. And I don't know if it was COVID or whatever there, but there was a delay that the vehicles come in a little bit later than what it was. And, and now I'm he hearing the dealers, they're asking me when I show up, do you have the latest news? When are we getting this car? Cause we, we can't wait to sell it. So, um, that's, that's really important because, as we know, the dealers have been an issue with electric cars. And yeah. part of that issue was if the salespeople weren't excited about the vehicle, if they didn't take interest in the vehicle, they kind of pushed it to the side and said, hey, you don't want that car. Hey, let me show you these cars over here. They're much better. But when you have the dealership on board and the salespeople saying, this is a car we can sell, then I think sales are going to do well. I, I think Volvo's, Volvo is going to do well with this vehicle. If I was in the market, I would definitely be considering it. Um, about the price, Dom, you had said about 50000 I think it's going yeah. to be a little more. I think it's okay. going to launch at about 55000 Okay, And that makes a big difference here in New Jersey because we just started a new state rebate, which is capped at $55,000. Uh. So. So that's the only negative the dealers are, you know, asking me, is there any way we could, you know, well, what if we discount the car $2,500? It doesn't work. It goes by the MSRP. It doesn't okay. go by the final sale price. So unfortunately, it looks like this vehicle isn't going to qualify for the New Jersey State $5,000 um, EV rebate, which is unfortunate. It would have really helped it. Uh, and some of its competitors that are just slightly less like Model Y, if you don't load it up on, with too many options, the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the right. Volkswagen ID4, all those vehicles are going to qualify for it, right. but this one isn't going to. So that's going to make it a little bit more difficult. But you know what? Volvo owners are super loyal. Um, the, uh, one of the most loyal brands. Uh, I, I think they're, I think a lot of these cars are going to sell to people coming in, bringing their Volvos into a lease and saying, what's your latest and greatest? And they're going to put them in a plug-in Volvo. Yeah, when I went to the event, I was really impressed by the the Vol they picked us up in in Volvos and and took us back to the airport in Volvos, and I, I hadn't really spent a whole lot of time in them except for, since like I had a friend with an old two forty wagon from the eighties, you know, that's my Volvo experience. But and this was like a like a world worlds apart from that, you know. When I look at them or when I in, inside it crawling around, I just think of the word like crisp. It just feels like I don't know. There's a sort of Scandinavian thing going on. So Kyle. 
Yeah, well, like, you're you're absolutely right. They're premium, but they're not pretentious. They're beautiful right. cars. They're built extremely well. I've driven every single Volvo product that they are selling today, including the Polestar variations as well, and uh, which technically aren't Volvos, but they're sort of Volvos. And um, they're great. So, you know, the thing that I love so much about these cars is we. I did a whole piece on the V60 uh, plug-in hybrid Polestar engineered version, which was an amazing car, but there's a lot going on there. You have a four-cylinder internal combustion engine with a turbocharger and a supercharger. And oh, by the way, there's a battery pack with an electric motor on the rear wheel. So it's just a lot going on. Right. The thing that I love so much about that car was the power, the handling, everything was great. So now we are going to get an XC40 with the same, roughly the same power output, very good handling, but not going to be as good as that Polestar V60. Uh, however, it's just going to be battery electric. So you don't have to worry about all this engine under stress and warm up and, oh, the engine's on. Oh, now it's off. Now we're running on battery. It's just going to be pure and silent and it's going to be amazing. So uh, we have pretty much decided on our side, Alyssa, uh, my girlfriend, has fallen in love with this particular spec this uh, green, I forget the name of the color, but it's a cool green XC40. It's only available in the recharge. And uh, I'm very certain we're going to put our deposit down on one of these and be one of the first to take delivery. Um, again, we're waiting on final pricing as the final judgment here. Uh, but this will be the replacement for our BMW i3. Now, I've pretty much already driven the recharge XC40. Uh, I've certainly sat in it at the CES show. But when I say that is I've driven the Polestar 2 which is the identical car underneath. Wow, uh, underneath, Literally, yeah. yeah, no change. The only difference is the body. And I drove the performance pack Polestar 2 and the non-performance pack. The non-performance pack, I believe, is going to be very similar to this XC40, um, and it'll be very good. So very much looking forward to that, and can't wait to see these on the streets. I'd say it's not a, an amazing electric car, but it is an amazing car that happens to be electric. It's a great looking vehicle too, right? I mean, you had the picture up there. I think it's one of the night most visually appealing, um, I guess, midsize crossovers or uh, midsize SUVs. I don't yeah, think it's that's pretty in the, small. It's is a, it in the compact it's, class? Yeah, I'm, it's, I'm not it's sure what class compact. it's in. Yeah, but but it's one of the nicest looking vehicles. To, uh, you know, I know that's obviously su subjective, but you know, I just I walk around it at the shows and just this is just a beautiful vehicle if if we needed that type of a vehicle it would definitely be a very high on my list and 249 249 miles of the wltp range what would what do you think that will be with the epa 225 yeah. what do you think yeah Kyle? i think it's going to be less i think we're looking at at low 200s here unfortunately i i don't think we're going to see um anything too amazing it's it is a great looking car though again the range we're not sure let's hope that they uh, get the charging curve a little bit better than Polestar 2 because we just had a story this week. I believe Bjorn was doing a Polestar 2 test. It hits 150 kilowatt peak, but it loses it so fast. So right. everything that we just praised the e-tron for doesn't have a lot of range, but it has that charging curve to make up for it. It does not at least appear at this time that the XC40 recharge will have that same deep charging curve. Now I've talked to the Polestar engineers about this. And again, they're using the same exact architecture as XC40. And they're being very conservative with their charging profiles. And these will get updated and opened up over time as they get data in from their fleet. And it will all happen over the air without a trip to the dealer necessary. Right, so your range today could be, it's not maybe your range tomorrow, you could have an extra you know, 10, 20 miles. They can certainly open up usable capacity of the battery pack, right. but what's probably more important is altering your charging curve. So your range after a charging session on a road trip could be greatly improved um, okay. because, you know, our, our theory, uh, and it's how uh, we set the cannonball record. It's how we've been able to travel quickly is to charge only when the car is pulling maximum rates. And yeah. then after that is charge just enough to get to the next station dead. And so, uh, you know, with a deep charging curve, it just gives you more optionality to go longer distances. Right on. All right. Well, sticking with Swedish car manufacturers, uh, we also learned this week that the Polestar Precept concept has been given the green light for production. Polestar is, of course, the all-electric brand of Volvo, 
and they're both owned by Geely out of China. Uh, the precept was first re was first revealed in February and was supposed to officially debut at the Geneva Auto Show. That was canceled, of course, and in lieu of that, the company released a few videos with Polestar CEO Thomas uh, Ingelath enthusing over its design. He has a design background. He's a German fellow. Um, but and, and I share this enthusiasm. We have it up on the screen there if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, but I wish there were more technical specs available. It's about the size of a Model S. I think it's a little bit bigger. Um, so it could compete with that or maybe even the Porsche Taycan. Uh, it's good, but it's hard to guess exactly how much performance it will have. It will uh, apparently be built in China and feature lots of recycled materials. It supposedly is going to have a lightweight carbon composite construction. I don't know. Kyle, what do you think about this thing? Well, look, I uh, Polestar isn't all about 100% performance. It's about taking a different path. It's what Volvo's done. It's why they're so successful. It's why I believe Polestar is going to be very successful. It's design driven first yes. with really good tactile feedback while driving, but not all out. Let me, you know, wipe your face off and smash your body into the back of the seat. You know, ludicrous acceleration. That's not what they're so about. So they're taking their own path. This is the Swedish way of making a sports car. And uh, it was very cool to see this car when Polestar and Koenigsegg got together. Uh, so Thomas and Christian von Koenigsegg did the little com you know, video together with That's both right. brands, which was really fun. The, Polestar, the uh, precept looks great. I have one huge issue with this car, though. And okay. that is, what is on the roof? Uh, right? What is that thing? It's so Starlink? weird. Starlink? Satellite? Like a Starlink? I'm sure it's uh -huh. for driver assistance, but it's no. kind of like the Xpeng uh, G3 has that selfie cam uh -huh. on the roof. It's kind of like that. And it almost ruins the entire car for me. I, it, if I had one, it would be the first thing I just rip off no matter the function. <laughs> well, don't forget, <laughs> this is a concept car. The production yeah. car is going to look, I, I think, radically different. I, I doubt yeah. if it would have. This has the... Uh, um, coach doors right suicide doors yeah um, that'll, that'll be different. you know so that so, and that's going to change the whole look of the vehicle um so you know i i i think that um it this will be interesting to watch but i i think the finished product is going to look um a lot different than what we see there in the concept and maybe it won't have the hat that kyle doesn't like <laughs> it, it kind of puts right? me in mind of the old uh, prelude you know but with sharper creases or something it's very sharp uh the thing with Polestar is, though, basically, uh, Thomas used to be the head of design at Volvo. So we're seeing a lot of this transfer over here. And um, I don't know. I think it's going to look very close to this. I don't think uh, – I think this is almost production. Look, it's they have everything from an FMVSS thing looking like it's figured out. They have the taillights in the right place. They have the headlights in the right place. It looks like the interior is really cool. It doesn't look concepty. This looks totally like something they would actually make. Yeah, look at those um, seats, you know, man. Those look so good. Look at those side bolsters. Very similar to Polestar uh, One seats. They're very nice. And yeah. when I see that interior, I see concepty. So we're looking yeah. at we're looking at it differently. Yeah, I, I don't that. see that. It looks totally production to me. These are seats that they're able to make. Uh, they're already making seats that look just like this. And um, yeah, yeah. I, honestly, it looks like everything's figured out. They got volume knobs front and rear, I guess. The I don't doors, really know what they you would think need to they'll change. use suicide doors. No, a coach doors. Uh, it's possible that they won't. It's possible that they will, but it has gold seat belts. What more do you need to know? <laughs> oh, you got me there. I, I, I say it's all, it's pretty much a safe bet to say that a car won't have these suicide doors that they show it in the concept form. But usually, that, they kind of do that so you know it shows that they can open up the whole thing and you can see take in the whole interior at once. It's really that's why they have suicide doors on concept vehicles, just so you can have a nice look at the interior of the car without, you know, that whole B pillar being in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And we don't have any specs on this. So we don't know, how, you know, how it will perform or how it, it I mean, it certainly looks like it, it will perform. It looks like a little handle. I mean, those, those, like those front seats, those side bolsters, you know, those are made for going around turns. Yeah. It's so beautiful. It definitely. <laughs> definitely looks cool. You know, yeah. I, when I, when I saw it, I, 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 look, I saw some Porsche Taycan. I saw some Model S. I saw a little bit of the Xpeng P7 from the front. So it was, um, you know, definitely a beautiful vehicle. I hope it stays 
true to that. I just, um, you know, to me, my first impression was that, you know, it's 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 going to be a disappointment when we see the production version. I, I hope I'm wrong. All right. Well, if you have an opinion on, on this car or if you're planning on buying one even, you can stop by the Inside EVs forum and we have a section already set up there for uh, Polestar. And, you know, if, if we have enough people coming over, we'll, you know, put a, the pre, a little subsection for just for the precepts. We have one for the Polestar. Excuse me. We have one already for the Polestar too. And so, yeah, that's great. So uh, let's take a little trip around the world. Uh, the Beijing Motor Show is underway. It's likely the biggest auto show so far this year. Of course, it's practically the only auto show this year. But anyway, they have a number of interesting electric vehicles making their debut, and I wanted to talk about some of them really quickly. Uh, we're not going to get too deep in the weeds here, uh, but it is good to look at uh, where the Chinese industry is right now with EVs uh, and just vehicles in general. It wasn't so long ago that uh, Chinese auto designs were something of a, a joke with a punchline about copycatting cars from other countries. Now, though, that's mostly left behind, and we're starting to see some interesting designs. Some are still a little over the top. Some might say garish, but I think this is a great time for Chinese design. I'd like the flamboyance that we can see in certain vehicles. Uh, so to kick this off, let's talk about a, a vehicle from an automaker we know a little bit about. The twist here <laughs> is that this thing isn't even a car, really. It's a two-passenger flying car, and I mean that in the loosest sense. But Tom, uh, what can you tell us about the awesomely named Xpeng Kiwi Gogo? <laughs> Yeah, so to call it a car is a little bit of a stretch. It's kind yeah. of like a large, um, uh, you know, uh, drone. <laughs> right. So, but uh, you know, it's not unusual. This is very common in in China now. A lot of the automakers there are working on um, these flying vehicles that they don't plan on using anytime soon. They 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 look at them more as like a technology incubator and also yeah. to keep an eye on the future so that. You know, if things do shift quickly and, and all of a sudden, you know, air transport, you know, personal air, air transport does become more popular, they'll have already had uh, a bunch of research in it um, and uh, and able to move on that. Now, Xpeng started a, its own company, Xpeng Motors, and the owner of Xpeng um, together formed a new company. I forget the name of it. And that's the company that's developing this product. But um, and I reached out to Xpeng when 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 this was announced and they one of the things they wanted to be very clear was they said look please make sure your readers understand there is no like shift in the company's plans we, we are here to make cars <laughs> you know we're, we're not we're not making this radical change but we just wanted to show off some of our technology and also let people know that look we're a future-minded company where they are still a startup expung they've only been yeah. you know in business a few years um, but they're already looking down the road, you know, down the runway at the um, in the future for, you know, whatever transportation modes are being developed and used at the time. So, um, yeah, that was it's that's a cool vehicle. I'd love to, I'd love to take a spin in it. Uh, I'm so disappointed I'm not at the Beijing Auto Show now. I, 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 I go there every year. Um, I, I do a lot of the uh, Chinese auto shows and the Beijing Motor Show is perhaps my favorite and um it's so disappointing that that i can't be there this year and seeing all these these cool things going on um i was invited by a couple companies that w wanted still to pay for my travel and and, and had to go there but i i didn't know if i if i'd be allowed back in the us i don't know right. how, how that's working right now so i said you know what I better not. They even f figured out how I could get there. We'll fly, uh, you know, from New York to Europe and then here or whatever. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I'd love to come, but uh, I, 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 the U.S. might not let me back in if I've been in China at this right. point. And they should because the, 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 the coronavirus has really been completely, not completely, but nearly completely suppressed there. So um, it's if anything, they should be worried about me going there at this point. But to make, you know, I digress. Um, the um, a lot of cool things are happening out there in Beijing now um, uh, at the at the motor show. Besides this flying Kiwi Go Go, Xpeng also announced that they're going to be giving three thousand kilowatt hours of free charging to their customers. I, I think it's th per year for three years. So wow. um, that's that 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 that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, if it's three thousand kilowatt hours per year. 
that's probably good for somewhere around 10 to 12,000 miles of driving per yeah. year. And that comes with the new, new Xpeng vehicles um, for three years. So that's, that, that, that's pretty good perk. It's kind of similar to what we see here with all these car companies announcing that they're going to do, you know, uh, Electrify America three years or two years or one year of unlimited charging. Volkswagen just announced that with the ID4. Um, they're, you're, they're going to, you're going to get three years of unlimited charging on the Electrify America network. So, um, uh, you know, the x doing it over there also. They also introduced a battery leasing program. I don't have all the details for it, but basically they're separating the cost of the battery from the car and allowing you to lease it separately. Now it's different than like the Renault Zoe where the battery like was, could be removed from the vehicle or, you know, they would take it out and replace it and give you a new one. That's not the case with x -Pung. They're just doing this um, to make it financially easier for customers to buy the x -Pungs. So you could like buy the car outright, but not pay for the battery and then lease the battery like a, a, a three-year lease or five-year lease. I, I think they purchase the vehicles a little bit differently than, than we do here because I, I don't understand why they would just roll that price into your lease price yeah. on your car. So they must have different financial ter terms in China for, for most buyers. But uh, those are the big news for from uh, um, China for Xpeng at least. Well, they the, also got a new. They also got a new. Sorry to interrupt you. They also oh, got yeah. a new factory, though, right? Forgot about which, that. Which is kind of kind bizarre. of big news. Yeah, yeah. So they're headquartered in um, Guangzhou, um, and um, but they they they've just built a va uh, a brand new state of the art factory in uh, uh, Zhaoqing or Zhaoqing, um, sure. and that. Uh, how do you pronounce that, Tom? Do you know? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I thought you were. In, Cut, cutting no, no. in there and telling me, but uh, yeah, that so that's their new state of the art factory just opened like two or three months ago, and uh, now they just announced that in partnership with uh, the the city of Guangzhou, they uh, are going to be building a new four billion dollar uh, factory in Guangzhou where their company headquarters is. So you know things are happening really at a breakneck pace for Xpeng. They just did a, a public. IPO here in the New York Stock Exchange. They have their right. second vehicle out, the P7, that from what I understand, is selling really well. I had the opportunity to drive it a few uh, weeks ago, one of only three people in the US to actually drive that vehicle. And uh, it was, you know, performed very well. It's a compelling vehicle. Um, that brings us to the uh, other news in China about all these other new cars that are being announced at the Beijing Motor Show. And right. without going into each one into detail, the one thing that I want to say is I've, I've studied the, the Chinese auto market for a while now. I've been visited there. I got to see the vehicles. I've gotten it driven to drive Neos and other uh, Chinese cars. And if people think that Chinese cars are still this like sub, you know, quality that, it, you know, is 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 less than what is available on the, the, for the rest of the world. You are woefully wrong. Now they're not a hundred percent of the way. They're not all of the companies. Right. But what has happened in the last four or five years with quality wise with Chinese cars, they are world competitors now. And this decade, we, by the end of this decade, China is going to be an automotive powerhouse like Europe is, like the U.S. is, like Japan is, like Korea is now. So. Um, no more Chinese junk cars that, you know, they're just copying other people and using old technology. They went out and hired designers. We talked about this before. They hired des designers from the, the existing companies, uh, engineers. Uh, they took some Chinese companies, took whole engineering teams from existing OEMs. And they are producing vehicles now that are world class. China is here in the automotive world. Right. So let's take let's take a look at some of these real quick then. So Honda is also there, and they showed off the SUV E concept. Um, it's a two door crossover with a shark like snout, and I don't mean that in a flattering way. Really, it's apparently it's an indication of an all new electric crossover SUV, a mass production model for China. It's kind of hard to judge what a production model might look like based on this because you know it'll have four doors and. You know, it's, it should be like substantially different, um, but so, and we don't have any specs, so I don't know. Tom, is there anything you like to like here? Oh, the side profile looks like a Neo ES8 to me. 
Okay. Um, particularly the front, the nose. Um, so yeah, I, you know, it's a, a interesting vehicle. It's it's the type of vehicle that people are looking for these days. It's that crossover. Uh, I just like the fact that Honda is talking about EVs. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, we can't we can't get them to give us one here in the U.S., but um, I guess eventually they're going to have to. Yeah, something about this car doesn't I don't know doesn't come together for me. Kyle, you have a quick thought about this? Uh, not particularly. Okay. We, no. can, we can move on. Uh, that's that's yeah. fine. <laughs> we have another. We have more. So this next one's a little more interesting to me. It's a. It's still very concepty with butterfly doors back and front and huge wheels, and it, but it's a Buick, which was uh, General Motors' bread and butter brand in China. Uh, it also revised the Electra nameplate, which is pretty cool. Um, some of these original uh, electros were quite handsome back in the day. Uh, if this is previewing a future model, it's safe to say that it won't look like this exactly. Uh, I've actually seen a, an electric Buick crossover during GM's uh, EV battery day earlier this year. And while the, the details of that particular vehicle are a little fuzzy in my, in my mind, uh, I'm pretty sure it didn't look anything like that. <laughs> but in any event, the Electra, Electra, uh, would supposedly offer more than 600 kilometers of range. That's 372 miles and would zip up to 100 kilometers per hour. It's 62 miles an hour in 4.3 seconds, which is good. Uh, yeah, it's really good, actually. Um, and uh, if it's made, it would, of course, use a an Ultium battery and powertrain components. Kyle, does the name Electra speak to you or does it uh, just conjure up boat size executive coupes from the 70s? Right. Yeah. Well, that's way before my time. But what I do think will be really great is those Buick if for our U.S. audience. You'll know what I'm talking about. The Buick commercials would finally be accurate because they have run these commercials where, you know, you're pulling up in a Buick to pick up your friend from the bar or wherever. And you're like, I'm right outside. I'm in the Buick. And they're like, <laughs> where? I don't see a Buick. They're standing in front of it, obviously. And, you know, it's supposed to be like, oh, they've changed their company. Meanwhile, it looks just like every other Buick. But this one would actually be accurate. You could pull outside be like, where are you? I'm in the Buick. I do not see one. I don't see a Buick here. This looks there is nothing going off of right. brand legacy or heritage speaking to anything that they've ever accomplished in the past um, other than making floaty boaty cars for our older generation to move around in. This is a radical change from anything they're doing. It's a radical change from anything GM has ever done. And uh, look, I'm just excited for that. Yeah. I think it's great. Someone finally realized we have nothing of value in the Buick brand. Start fresh and do something interesting. And here you go. And oh, by the way, Buick is huge in China. Yeah. So this is a big move. Uh, just from a brand perspective, looking forwards, I think it could be the future of Buick. Nice, Tom. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm just happy that they brought back the Electra name. I've been waiting for that. It's one of those names like that, you know, it's, it's, it's iconic for, for Buick for many years. And uh, it was like, that's going to be whenever Buick does make an electric car, their first electric car, it's got to be called the Electra, you know, and um so uh, I've been waiting for this. It's a cool looking car. It's a cool looking concept. Um, you know, uh, if if this does come to market eventually, it's not going to be anything like that. So it's hard to get too excited about something that, you know, it's like enough with the concepts. We want to drive our EVs now. Yeah. But uh, I'm glad they're, they, it looks like they're bringing back the Electra name. That's what I take out of this. Right. Right on. And hopefully it'll, it'll come to the U.S. too. But... Uh, so next up, we have the Voya i3 electric SUV concept. Voya is the luxury division of, of the Chinese state-owned Dongfeng Motor Corporation. Um, now, speaking of design, this one's got some really interesting features. The air comes up through the grill area, uh, which is textured with like a large scallop diamond shapes. And it comes up through the hood where that texture continues. It's kind of a striking thing going on. I can't tell exactly how well it works because I can't see it in person, but... Uh, anyway, it's definitely t worth taking a look at. There's no technical details yet, but apparently some version of this will go on sale in China next year. So it's, it could look, I don't know how close to this could possibly look. But Tom, <laughs> do you care for this or is it a bit much? It's a bit much. And when I see the front, even though it's an SUV, uh, when I see the grill, it reminds me of the Fisker Karma, um, that yeah. like Cheshire cat grin oh. a little bit. Um, 
you know, even though I know it, it's much taller up because it's an SUV, but that's what I see initially when I see that. I see the Fisker Karma a little bit in the front. What, can we see the back end there? Yes, one Sorry. second, pulling it up. There we go. Uh, can can we just say um, someone at this company must be blind <laughs> because this is awful. Oh, yeah? It's really bad. <laughs> Like not even close to being good. Who in their right mind would want to drive this dinosaur looking thing going down the road with crazy textured stuff everywhere? Like what is going on here? This is, I don't understand it. This is so bad from everything Volvo is doing so well. That's all you need to do to make a great looking car. Just copy a Volvo. Don't do this. This is so bad. I could see like birds getting sucked in that grill in the front <laughs> as you're driving down the road. Well, they anyway, just come up over your windshield because you know, it's, no, they'll it's go really in like those holes in the front. That they will the, those giant holes, like oh. <laughs> it's just gonna gobble up children that you're driving over. It looks really bad, and like I wouldn't even like imagine what people must think about you to drive through a quaint small town in this thing. Like it's. Oh, all right. Let's yeah. move on to the next because this okay. is just out sure. of the world terrible. So the, the Beijing Radiance concept is a pretty slick looking design. I thought it's a it's a sedan with uh, 800 kilometers of NEDC range. That would be 497 miles in in freedom units. Uh, <laughs> freedom it, units. I love it. <laughs> but it, but in reality, it would probably get far less because the NEDC is uh, test is super optimistic. But uh, not a lot of detail here either. But, you know, it looks pretty good. It's pretty slippery looking. I don't know. What do you think? I like the logo, actually, at the back. The little the B and the E, they're kind of, they're kind of like opposites. It's yes, small... it's very Bugatti-esque back there. Uh, right. The B and the E. I, I, I like it. Um, it looks just like a Lucid Air concept. You know those wheels? So they have, it looks like the same as the uh, Audi e-tron aero wheels or something, don't they? Yeah, but I think that's, it's just a, yeah, there's only so much you can really do with wheels. It's kind of I-Pace-esque, these wheels as well. Reminds me of the uh, i8 wheels. The BMW yeah, i8 wheels, the, one of their versions looks similar to that. Okay. The, and the shape of this car reminds me of that. Remember that Mercedes concept car that came out a few years ago with the, the coach doors also that was like a self-driving? You, you look, it yes, was a lounge. The, the seats were uh. facing each other inside. It reminds me of that a little bit. Was it like the, was it the one with the omnidirectional wheels? Like it kind of goes sideways or anything? That that thing? Or I don't think the one I'm talking okay. about goes sideways. No. Right. Right. Okay. Different one. Okay. Well, so the Netta Eureka Zero Three concept is a funky looking thing, uh, especially in profile. Let's see. It's got a similar range figures as that last car, about 800 kilometers or 900 or 496 miles uh, on the NEDC. So you know less than that. Uh, both say 325, I'm guessing. I don't know. But it's got a four second zero to 100 kilometers per hour time, which is respectable. Um, those headlights are kind of super exaggerated Thor Hammer Volvo type looking things. Uh, and also, there's a neat flying buttress element to the C pillar in the back there. It's reportedly coming to Chinese roads in 2020. And I think this might be closer to the Model 3. Kyle, do you like this as much as the Model 3, or is this too much going on here? No, Eureka. I'd look at the headlights. That's all I want to say. What is going on <laughs> up here? What, I don't really understand the Chinese uh, concept car market, and Tom probably does more than, uh, than any of us because he spent a lot of time in China That's understanding right. the culture, understanding their market, and also these cars. But I've never heard of any of these, and right. they're all ugly. <laughs> so they don't do anything for me. I mean, that's my, my personal opinion. I can't wait right. till we see some production ones, but like, th is this attractive to people in China? Because to me, I, I wouldn't want to be within 20 feet of this. I feel like I'd catch a disease. <laughs> huh. Well, you know, uh, what, one thing that I do notice is a lot of the cars that seem like they're going to be designed just for the Chinese market, like this might be one of them. Um, have more radical designs than the automakers that are trying to um, have a world, make a world brand, you know, and, and be a global manufacturer. They're the ones that bring in, I think, designers from uh, other countries and other existing OEMs. And, and so they kind of tone down 
uh, the styling, uh, like, you know, we talked before about Polestar, you know, having the, the, the designer, uh, you know, from Volvo. So, you know, but these, some of these, uh, and there's a million Chinese car companies, uh, it, it, your head spins when you walk around these shows. It's not like, the when when we go to the the car the car shows here in the U.S. where you see Ford, Mercedes, Nissan, all the, the names you know, it's just one after another after another after another that you know have some of them have these crazy wild designs. Uh, many of them never even come to market. So you know the Chinese market is still you know the auto market is still you know up and coming, uh, and and there's a lot of newcomers trying to make huge splashes with these cr wild designs and. Uh, but you don't really see them on the roads in China, like these crazy wild designs. So I think a lot of these cars that we're looking at now that have these like far out um, design language are just concepts. And if that type of vehicle ever does come to market, it's not going to be quite as wild. Now, this last one that we looked at isn't that wild other than the headlights. You know, I mean, it's 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 not that crazy. And um, but, I you know, I, I don't recall seeing anything that you know, stunning on the roads in China. They're mostly just, you know, regular cars and uh, with, with with Asian design language built into it, which is a little bit different than what we have in Europe and the US, but nothing that 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 wild and far out. Yeah, right. that car wasn't that wild, but it yeah. was that ugly. But the next <laughs> one, the next yeah. one I'm very excited about because this okay. is one of my favorite automakers from China. Dominic, please introduce. Sure. Okay, so finally we have the Aura Futurist. Now, Aura is the electric brand of Great Wall, uh, which has a reputation for, um, say, copying some designs in the past. But the Futurist, it's probably one of my favorite cars here. It's not as sleek as the, most of the others, but it's got all these retro cues that I, I just love. It's uh, actual non-body colored bumpers for starters. Uh, and I love I love everything about this. Uh, the wheels, the mint color paint, the lack of a beep pillar, the glass roof. Uh, inside, uh, the retro from the future theme kind of continues. It's got a screen in there, but there's lots of other styling cues that could be from the 50s. Um, it's, it's supposedly a near production prototype. Uh, so there will be changes, of course. Um, I don't actually, and, and the original view, you know, it kind of puts me in mind of like a, of a Soviet something someone was saying it had like a mock e thing going on with the front but you know like a, when i look at the front three quarters and down the side i, I can't even quite think not not like a lot of but well it's kind of like a lot of got rear-ended by a mustang and it just kind of squished <laughs> into the shell yeah i think it looks great i, I love, love this car i would drive this every day everywhere i don't care if they copy stuff this is cool and i love the color i would want it in this exact spec that's awesome yeah I, I agree i just wonder if that'll translate to the chinese market like it would in the u.s you know because we right. they don't have that history of automobiles i mean this is the first generation of chinese people that uh, that that owned cars other than the very wealthy, you know, it, it's for the first time, uh, you know, the quote unquote middle class in China are buying and driving cars. So they don't have that affinity with the past like we do. You know, they didn't, their grandfather didn't drive something that looks like this, you know, like, so, you know, that I wonder how well that's going to do there, but uh, I'd love it too. I think that thing's so, so cool. I would definitely drive one of these. Yeah. When right. I was saying this is the car I was really excited about, I actually didn't think this one was next, but I oh, still oh, am sorry. very much excited about this car. Uh, and I, I really think they hit it out of the park with the design. We'll see what the specs are if it ever makes it to production, but that's a nice car. Right. I, 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 so that was my fault. I, I skipped over one by mistake. So skipped let's, over let's, the best one. Let's, let's back up to that. Okay. So um, tell me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, if you know, uh, but the Hongqi has been around for a while honk it is honky okay honky. Yeah. <laughs> same um, this is like okay this is like the rolls royce of china no joke right. this is like it's, where the president rolls around in. these things are nice right it's basically they've been making like i i think they're kind of obnoxious looking uh, limousines for chinese government officials for for yes. years now and the what's this the e dash hs9 it looks very honky with that big uh <laughs> honky sorry with that big big not just grill on the front but it's an suv now and apparently electric 
and it's uh, going to be like six figures, they say. And it looks... Oh, I don't it's going to be an absorbent amount of money. This is yeah. a Rolls-Royce competitor, Rolls-Royce Cullinan competitor for China. Um, right. The thing I love about it is this amazingly huge crystal shifter. Look at this thing. Oh. That is crazy. <laughs> it's so weird. And I, I love these cars because it, it's so... Uh, like they haven't driven anyone else's cars. It's very much unique designs, unique styling cues that's carried through for the past 50 years of making these things. And the fact that now it's an SUV form just makes it even better because you can drive over stuff in like your old Chinese, new Chinese car. I, I think it's so cool. And uh, I hope one day I get the opportunity to drive the big limo and then this uh, SUV. Right, yeah, right on. Oh, yeah, those old limos look pretty cool actually yes um, it reminds me of a lincoln from that front view doesn't it like a lincoln aviator yeah. or something like that to me yeah I mean, if, kind if of like gonna... someone described an aviator over the phone and then that's what <laughs> they ended up with. <laughs> uh, all right hey i understand the ford mustang mach -E actually made an appearance at this uh beijing motor show tom can you tell us anything about that yeah so we, we don't know um, I mean, not more than to say they introduced it and it's going to okay. be for sale there. They're, they're, you know, the, the, the Mach-E is, is going to go on sale in China. And, uh, you know, the people that are Ford of China is uh, working on a plan now on seeing how it fits into the market there. And uh, which is good news. You know, I, I, to be honest with you, I wasn't aware that Ford was bringing this to, to China. And uh, maybe we reported on it. And I just missed it. But um, good on Ford. You know, it's it's going to be a real world car. It's got stiff competition over 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 in China. You know, Model Y is has been well received. It, you know, is is there? People are are waiting for the Model Y. The uh, also the Link and Co. I don't know if you saw. We did that post. Oh, yeah. We talked about it last week. That's kind of like right in the wheelhouse of this vehicle. That 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 zero concept that's coming to market and. And the ID4 is uh, is going to be direct competition for the the Mustang. And the problem that one of the problems they have over there is like in in Europe in the U.S. the 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 Mustang name is so iconic. You know, it, it people will look at it just because it's a Mustang. You know, they, they might not buy it, but it, it'll get it. It'll get it a look, and and people might consider it. I don't know if that translates over in China. I don't know how how well how much cachet that the Mustang name carries. It could just be another, you know, it could, you know, you know, it, it certainly doesn't have the prestige of a hunky. <laughs> so so uh, you know Well to um, be clear, nothing does. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> so you know, that's what I'm concerned about is how how will the general public um, view this car like uh, they certainly are to look at it like we do in U.S. and Europe. But I mean, it's got to it's got to um, make it or break on its own uh, performance. You know, on, on 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 does it does it deliver the range, the driving experience right. for the price that the that the price point that the competition does? And it's tough competition for this vehicle over in China. Yeah, this could be interesting. This could be like a really breakthrough vehicle for Ford in China because I don't know if I don't know if China's really been as big for Ford as it has been for like for GM with Buick and, and things. But uh, yeah. you know, it, no. it, the the Mach has got its own sort of style and performance sort of package. It's you know, it's kind of like the Model Y, but it's you know, you can it's a very separate kind of thing, and. You know, uh, so it'd be interesting if the if could help the Ford brand name all you know overall over there. But uh, speaking of the Maki, this week we actually saw it get as much as three thousand dollars chopped off its price tag, depending on the trim level. Uh, that's except for the uh, fast GT version. That that price stays the same. It, it breaks it basically breaks down like this: uh, three thousand less for all premium trim models, two thousand less for all uh, California Route One models, and one thousand less for all select and first edition models. That's a that's a pretty great savings. Uh, and I don't know if it's if it really needed the help, but this will, you know, most likely help move even some more electric metal. So I, I, oh, Tom, go ahead. I was gonna I was gonna say I want to know both of your opinions on why this happened now. ID four. Yeah, that's I, my opinion. Think? Yeah. That, 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 that's what I was talking uh, to a couple friends about, and they 
both said definitely it's a response to the I because it happened right after you know we get all the initial initial pricing for the ID like two days after right and the I and the ID four you know is 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 right in this wheelhouse yes they're different I mean they're the same 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 type of vehicle but they had served different purposes I'm I I'm not a hundred percent convinced of that I think it's possible um, but I also think that there's a possibility that this was planned all along with Ford. That they've that, been doing it the whole way. That's it, Kyle. You just said it. What Ford has been doing from the beginning of the the when they first announced this is they just keep making the vehicle better. They keep right. giving us more. They keep giving. So here we are, right before the launch. What's better than saying, "Hey, and by the way, three grand less." So, you know, I, right. I'm not completely convinced that this was driven as a response to the ID4. I think that's the easy answer. That's to say, oh, well, you know, Volkswagen came out. It certainly you know, didn't hurt the timing. It, it didn't hurt the timing, but I give Ford more credit. And I'll tell because I just love everything they've done with this car. I love, Agreed. I love the vehicle. I love the marketing. I love how they got the press involved, how they they brought Bill Ford out to introduce it and had the whole lineup of Mustangs. That they are, they pushed all their chips in on the, on on this vehicle, Ford. So I don't think that they would make such a a quick reactionary decision like, oh shit, um, the ID four costs less. We got to chop the price. I, I give Ford more credit. I think that th this has been planned all along. I, I tend to agree with that. Um, look, we've seen it from acceleration. We've seen it from features. We've seen it from everything here. Uh, Mach-E GT is what now uh, the same exact acceleration rate as Model Y. Uh, it keeps getting better and better. Uh, Ford was really cool. You know, I went over there and drove it in the simulator uh, at their uh, virtual vehicle development facility here in North Carolina. They've been, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, they even held back in there and they're like, here's the good one. And then let me show you kind of like what we're working on. Mm -hmm. And it was like, whoa. So um, yeah, there, that's absolutely correct. Does it make a difference? I don't know if we'll see increased sales, but I will say people had already ordered this car through their dealers and now are saying, oh, hey, by the way, you don't have to spend three grand. I mean, it's really a last minute right before delivery start. No one's going to be upset about this. That's just like a giant birthday present for everyone who's ordered one. And Kyle, here in New Jersey, it makes a huge difference because you can load up the uh, the the the, the Mach-E to, to break the $55,000 uh, threshold for the state rebate. That's so, nice. so now that can make the difference between it's an $8,000 savings. <laughs> you know, you get the $5,000 oh, yeah. rebate and the $3,000 that will make the difference between selling the car and not selling the car, you know? So, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that certainly not saying they did it in a reaction to New Jersey, but it, it definitely makes a difference here. I'm sure the dealers in New Jersey are going to be super happy when they, when, when, when they get this news, well, they've got it ready, but when they, digest it right on well I, I hope they didn't uh lower it because of the id4 because i think it's really a separate vehicle and it stands on its own and i think it would have competed okay against the id4 at the original price but yeah three thousand dollars you can't really argue with that that's like and talking almost. about the id4 i drove one yesterday Ooh. why are you it? telling us this now i because i can't talk about it Oh, well, then why'd you bring it up? <laughs> just, just to make you a little jealous. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, well, I love the ID4. They've done, yeah, such a great job on that car from a design and cost perspective. I'm very excited about it. Volkswagen right is going to sell hundreds of thousands of them every year. Well, that's totally like a great. That sounds like a pretty positive impression. Okay, well, we're, we're kind of almost out of time. So really quickly, I just want to touch on uh, this other other little vehicle that popped up. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't think it was shown at China, but they sort of presented, you know, they talked about it there. And that's the RM20E, which is short for the electrified RM20E racing midship sports car prototype that was produced. Uh, no, it was, uh, it's a Honda, basically it's a Hyundai Veloster in black and white. And I believe Remac Automobile is helping them develop this thing. It's a race car. Um, and maybe hopefully bound eventually for an electric touring car series. It's got a 60 kilowatt hour pack. It uses f liquid flooded battery module technology. So, you know, amongst all the cells, they're all floating around in uh, like a dielectric fluid, uh, which is a cooling strategy that I guess, uh, you know, I guess Remac probably has a hand in. 
and we could end up it's a kind of curious interesting to me because that could end up in other hyundai products or uh, porsche also has a, an ownership stake in T remax so you know porsche could be looking at that sort of thing and speaking of remax they may be buying bugatti which is kind of a big power move you know so we could see this sort of electric technology ending up in like a like a the premium, most premium of, of brands. Um, yeah. So, but just back to this thing real quick. So it's got four motors, but they're midship or they're ahead of the rear axle a little bit. So, uh, that's cool. And they're all, and it just powers the real, it just powers the rear axle as well. I don't think it's an all wheel drive. It puts out 810 horsepower and 700 pound, 708 pound feet of torque, uh, less than three seconds and zero to hundred kilometers an hour. Uh, zero, uh, zero to 200 kilometers an hour or 124 miles an hour, 124 miles an hour is under 10 seconds. Top speed is over 155. So, you know, pretty lethal track weapon, I would say. Yes, yeah. please bring it to us. We want to test this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, not, this is definitely not going to be sold in dealers, but, uh, right. it would be nice if they could find a way of, find a way of bringing it over to, uh, the US. Basically, if it arrives on our doorstep randomly by some right. way, uh, they will not have a lack of content from us on this car. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so moving along real quick. So like, while well, Mustang is getting a, a price decrease, if you have a Model Y, not the performance Model Y, but just like a long range Model Y, you can pay $2,000 extra and get a little acceleration boost. It shaves off like half a second off the zero to 60. Any, any number, yeah. any anything on this, Tom or Kyle? You know, I love that that Tesla's offering this. It's just it it's it's just too much, in, in my opinion. You know, I I have the Model Three dual motor long range, and and it's also available on the Model Three. But if okay. it was if it was made if it was more reasonable, I'd go for it. I still think I would love if they could do a temporary power boost. Like uh, I'm sure they could. Like I'd pay a hundred bucks for them to give it to me for 24 hours. You know, I wish right. you could order it through the app and get the power boost like f on a day where I'm going driving, you know what I mean? But I don't need it all the time. I don't need to spend $2,000 for it all the time. What, don't you think that would make money for them? Don't you think that'd be a cool option? Like you can order it on the app. It takes effect like within 15 minutes or whatever. And, uh, and, and, and it expires in 24 hours. If they can give you the power, they can take it away. So right, well, it would be just as easy for them. That be, that brings up an interesting model, though, as well for the enhanced and full self-driving options too. If we start to see short-term subscriptions to this, there's no reason why they couldn't do it for the performance boost. The performance boost to me has no real benefit uh, other than like it goes a little bit faster. But in electric cars, you always calibrate to the speed of the car. So if I'm driving around a bicycle and I get in my electric smart car, it feels really fast. And then if I go from my electric smart car to the i3, that feels really fast. But then... It, you just get used to it. It doesn't matter. There's no noise. It, it, so it's like, I, you know, I had a P100D for a year. That felt slow after about a week of owning it because it's always like, oh, well, it was faster when it was warm before. So I don't see the benefit of spending a lot of money to make EVs accelerate faster. What I do see the benefit of, though, is give the people track mode on a sub uh, subscription basis, for especially for rear-wheel drive Model 3, but also for dual motor. It's so easy for them to do. They would be able to make so much money from performance EV enthusiasts who own Model 3, which, by the way, there are many of them who would love to pay 500 bucks, 1000 bucks for track mode on their cars. Sure. Yeah, somebody needs to tweet that at Elon, and let's get something happening here. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our show. We've gone a little over our time, but um, thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post the YouTube comment section below or on the Inside EVs Forum podcast thread. Uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Uh, Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I am at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications and we'll see you all next week. Ciao. Thank <laughs> you.